This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Chapter 11 deals with divisional performance measurement. And this is a very, very important part of the syllabus indeed. Because there are very often questions with two divisions and you're asked to comment on how each of the divisions is doing. There are two main approaches to divisional performance measurement, and the first is return on investment, which is very like return on capital employed. Since you look at head offers, it's got a couple of divisions. Head offers is investing money into those divisions, and we're looking at the earnings which the divisions make, and expressing that really as a percentage of the capital employed. So it is the controllable profit before interest and tax divided by the capital employed. Really just as though you're doing return on capital employed on an independent company. So I would say that this one here is going to be pretty familiar. Uh, the other one is residual income, which you may remember from paper F5. And residual income is essentially saying that it's as though head office was the bank the bank is giving finance to the divisions, but the divisions should be asked to pay, or at least notionally asked to pay, for the use of finance. So basically you take their profits, you subtract a notional interest charge for the use of finance, and you see if they're left with anything at all, that will be the residual income. If the residual income is positive, it means they are earning enough to pay for the finance plus something more, and that's a worthwhile division. If residual income is negative, it means they are not making enough profit really to pay for their use of finance. And if they were a standalone company really having to pay for its finance, it probably wouldn't be able to survive. So let's see these two uh, methods in uh, operation in some simple examples. So here we have a current uh, position. Uh, we have got the divisional capital, the divisional income. We have cost of capital of 14%. And this division is thinking about whether or not it should take on an additional investment of 2 million, uh, which is going to uh, yield 0.3 after depreciation. All the profits we're dealing with are after depreciation, but before interest and tax. So what we can do, we'll do it first of all for return on investment. Uh, what is this company uh, at the moment working out for return on investment? And the return on investment is going to be 1.8 over 10. It's going to be 18%. That's uh, nicely uh, above the cost of capital. Uh, the division is earning 18%. It really only needs to earn 14% to be able to pay for dividends and interest and so on, whatever the, the capital is made up on. And now the manager is uh, saying, what would happen if I took on this additional investment? So the uh, ROI would then become as follows. So the income, instead of being 1.8, would be 1.8 plus 0.3. And the investment will be the original 10 plus another 2. So we've got in uh, here 2.1 divided by 12 is 17.5. So here the manager would look at this and said, if I were to take on this investment, my return on investment would fall. And the manager then says, well, if I'm being assessed on return on investment, and if indeed my bonuses depend on return on investment, I will reject that project. Why would I volunteer to reduce my return on investment, which makes my division looks worse? Even though, of course, and here's the, the big kind of dilemma, this investment is a worthwhile one. If we just looked at this on its own, we're getting 0 0.3 
uh, for 2 million, that is going to be 15%, which is, of course, above the 14%. This is a worthwhile investment. This would yield a positive net present value, yet this manager is saying no. And we have here a basically a lack of goal congruence, or what might be called dysfunctional decision making. The manager is doing something which is good for the division, but which is bad for the group. Let's see how this would work if we're looking at residual income. So the way residual income works, we take the current position to start with here. The residual income, you start with the divisional income, which is 1.8. Sorry about that. Right up here, 1.8. And then we make a notional charge for the division's use of capital. So the notional interest charge it's going to be at 10 at 14%. So that's going to be 1.4 of that. So the residual income is going to be 0.4. So indeed, this is a worthwhile division. It pays for its capital and it still makes another 0.4. What happens now if it takes on this proposed project? So the divisional income will now be the original 1.8 plus the new income plus 0.3 is equal to 2.1. The notional interest charge, I'll just call that NI, will be the 14% applied now to the capital in the division, which will have been the original capital 10 plus the new capital of 2. So 14% times 12, 1.68. And we're going to end up at 0.42. So here what has happened, we started with the residual income of 0.4. By taking on this project, we go to 0.42. This will make this manager look better. The higher the residual income, the better. The, the more you are left with after you were to, if you had to pay your uh, finance costs. So there is no uh, dysfunctional decision making here. Uh, there is goal congruence. The manager is encouraged to do uh, what is good for the group. What is good for the division is good for the group. And this is one of the key, well, normal key advantages. It's not guaranteed. This is one of the key advantages of residual income. So I think on the, the next slide we have summarized uh, all of that uh, here. We have the uh, that return on investment, which went from 18 down to 17.5. And we have the residual income, which went from 0.4 up to 0.42. And it's the residual income which tends to push the manager in the correct direction. What are the uh, pros and cons of return on investment and residual income? First of all, a difficulty, if you like, which uh, uh, applies to both of them. In both cases, as a division gets older, its capital base tends to reduce. The machinery depreciates. The older machinery will have been bought at lower costs, assuming there's some sort of inflation. Uh, so as the uh, division ages and its machinery depreciates, the capital base gets lower and lower, so the return on investment will increase. Return on investment is income divided by the capital. If capital decreases, return on investment increases. Similarly, residual income will increase. Uh, you have perhaps the same 
income for each of the periods, but then you are applying the interest rate or the cost of capital to the amount of capital which is employed there to get the notional interest charge. And if the amount of capital is shrinking because of depreciation, then the notional interest charge will also get less. So both of these methods favour older divisions. And indeed, if you have an old division with almost fully depreciated assets, and uh, you're thinking, should I renew my assets to uh, perhaps uh, make products of a better quality? As soon as you renew those assets, the, in the, the asset base goes up, and both your residual income and your return on investment will go down. So this can be a real disincentive to updating your division. Secondly, uh, comparison can be difficult. If one division owns all its assets, another one leases all its assets. Assuming we're talking about operating leases here, those leases will not be on the statement of financial position. They will not appear in the capital employed. Uh, and again, a, 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 a division which leases assets will be more favourably looked upon or will appear to be more favourable under both return on investment and residual income. Its capital is less and therefore the residual income and return on investment are both less. Return on investment advantages, first of all, it appears to be uh, familiar. It's, it's like return on capital import, employed. People feel fairly comfortable with it. You can use it to compare how a company or a division is doing to a target, set 15% or whatever it is, it's a target, uh, and this will encourage managers only to adopt projects which keep the return on investment of the division up. It's good for divisions of different sizes because you are comparing income to capital. So two divisions, one twice the size of the other, there's perhaps no reason why they can't have the same return on investment if they manage their assets with the same efficiencies. And very often outside analysts look at the return on capital employed of companies and they give, give you know, favourable recommendations that the return on capital employed is high and the share price will probably go up if the return on capital employed looks very uh, 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 favourable and, and, and the like. Uh, and it might be worthwhile encouraging all of our managers to concentrate on return on capital employed or return on investment because this is what the, 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 the shareholders will actually be interested in. However, as we've seen, there may be this lack of goal congruence it can result in otherwise worthwhile investments being rejected because they have this distorting effect on the manager's return on capital employed or return on investment. For residual income, it is more likely to produce congruent, uh, goal congruent decisions. We are more likely to take up uh, uh, new projects which are worthwhile. You can apply different notional interest rates to projects with different risk. So different divisions, in fact, uh, can be burdened with different interest risks, uh, interest rates. And you know from F9 that the higher the risk, the higher should be the return demanded by people. Uh, and so you can require a risky division to have a higher hurdle to pass before it gets into uh, positive residual income. However, it is unfamiliar to people, and one of its big faults is there is no good at really comparing divisions of different sizes. A division which is twice the size of another, all things being equal, it will have residual income twice the size. It's making twice the profits, it has got twice the capital employed, the notional interest is therefore twice that of the smaller one, and so the residual income is simply twice. So when you're looking at different divisions with different residual incomes, you're never quite sure what is the uh, fault of a manager uh, or, or, or what is good behaviour of a manager boosting residual income or what is simply the result of that manager is in charge of a bigger division which indeed should produce higher residual income. Now let's look at uh, this looks very complicated. We'll just talk through it uh, very, very uh, simply. What we have here is we have invested an asset 
are for 750,000. It's going to last five years and it's going to be depreciated on a straight line basis. So it'll be what 150,000 per annum. So let's look at year one here. So we have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the capital or the, uh, the net book value, the initial cost of the investment. Just set up this division, 750,000 put into it. There is depreciation of 150,000 and the book value carried forward to the next year is going to be 600,000. Income before depreciation, I'm telling you, is going to be 200,000 for each year. So after depreciation, it'll be 200,000 less 150,000. Income after depreciation is 50,000. And the return on investment is therefore 50,000 income after depreciation divided by the initial investment 750,000. Uh, it, it is uh, going to be 6.7. We can just check that there. Income 50 divided by the initial capital employed 750 is giving us 6.7. Residual income it'll be the 50,000 uh, and it says here the cost of capital is 10% so we're going to charge this division 10% on its use of capital for the year 750,000 so it's going to be 50,000 less interest rate applied to 750,000 less 75 it's going to be a negative 25,000 a bit of a problem here because in this first year this manager will say oh gosh I don't want to maybe take on a project with a negative effect on my residual income and, and could well resist that. Let's see what happens the second year. So we had 750,000 first year, less depreciation. We have the 600,000 is the capital employed for the second year. Depreciation straight line is going to be the same all the time. So you can see here the way it's going, the carried forward capital is just going like that as we take each one each year's depreciation off. The income before depreciation is the same. The depreciation is a straight line and so course the income after depreciation is the same for each year. However in the second year the capital employed is less and the return on income is going to be the 50,000, the income after depreciation, divided by 600, is going to be 8.3. And the residual income is going to be 50,000, less 10% of 600,000, is going to be minus 10. So we've improved. Uh, our return on investment has gone up from 6.7 to 8.3. Our residual income has gone from minus 225 to minus 10. We'll just do one more. So we're down here at 50,000. 50,000 divided by the capital employed, 450, giving us 11. And the residual income, 50 minus 10% of that. At last, we are in positive residual income territory. The problem with this is that this manager sit, just sits back and does nothing spectacular and is guaranteed improving return on investment and improving residual income. And it's not really a very good measure of performance if you think about it. it, it it's almost a distorted improvement we're getting here. Your assets are getting old and wearing out and this gives the illusion, I suppose, that you are improving your performance as a manager. How can we get round this distortion which has been introduced simply by the passage of time? And this brings us on to a slightly complex uh, issue which is known as annuity depreciation. If you borrow money from a bank, let's say we borrowed 750,000, had to repay it over five years, you are repaying each year two things. You're repaying some interest on that borrowing and you also repay some capital. So at the end of the day, you're going to be 
repaying 750000 If we're going to be repaying the loan and interest in equal installments, exactly the same amount each year, the way you can find the install installment is to say, right, our interest rate is 10%. Uh, we're repaying over five years. We're repaying 750000 and its interest over five years. You take the 750000 and you divide by the five-year cumulative 10% factor. So this will say, this is what you have to repay. This is the 5% five-year 10% cumulative factor, this will allow you to repay the capital and to pay the interest of 10% on the outstanding capital each year. The first year, there's lots and lots of interest and a little capital repayment. The last year, you've repaid lots of capital. Interest is quite small. And most of that, 197000 is going to be a repayment of capital. And what we do is, in a way, a bit of a fiddle. What we're going to be saying is that the interest and the depreciation each year are going to amount to that 197837. So interest plus the notional interest plus depreciation uh, are going to, uh, or the, the real interest if you like, are going to uh, add up each year to this annuity amount of 197. 837. So let's see how that would work out. So exactly the same kind of starting figures as before. Okay. So we, in a way, borrow 750,000. So if you remember, this was exactly as we had before. I just go back. There we are. We borrowed 750,000 uh, there. Uh, and what we're doing now is we're saying, right, the finance cost there is 75, that is 10% of that. That, that. that is the easy thing to do. It's, the, the finance cost is always going to be 10% of your opening capital. And the depreciation is the rest of 197,837. So if you take 197,837, and you take off the 75,000, you'll end up with that. So here we have the, basically the, the net book value is going to be this less that. Okay, so net book value is the initial book value less a depreciation. The total of the finance and the depreciation is always going to be this 197,837. Okay. So, what are we uh, uh, getting with uh, here in terms of, say, the residual income uh, here? Well, we have the income uh, before depreciation and finance. 200,000. That's the same as last time. We kept 200,000 each year for the income before depreciation and finance and so on there. And what we're going to do is to take off this 197 each year. So the sum of taking out the depreciation, which we have to do, and then essentially making a charge for the finance, which is going to be 75,000, is bringing us down to 2163. The next year, so this was our net book value carried forward, it goes up to here. The finance charge is going to be 10% of that value, so here we have 10% again. And the depreciation is going to be 197 less the finance charge. Okay. Finance charge and depreciation will always come up to this annuity amount of 197,837. So that's a depreciation. Uh, and now the book value carried forward is 163 less 135. So uh, 163 less 135, a bit pun, uh, 627 minus 135 coming down to that. 
So that was your book value carried for, brought forward. This is the appreciation this year. This is the book value carried forward. The total of the finance and depreciation, that plus that, will be coming to 197,837. Income before depreciation, the same each year. Uh, and therefore the residual income, that's the income after depreciation, after the finance charge, is, is, is simply going to be coming to that minus that again. You know, 2163. It's going to stay exactly the same each year. And you can work through this. You see, it, it works out kind of perfectly here. By the time you get down to the last year, you look at your finance charges. You say the balance of the 197837 is going to be the depreciation. And it will come out to be other little roundings. It's going to come out to have completely depreciated that asset. Although the depreciation rate of the depreciation starts quite small per annum and gets bigger which is a bit counterintuitive. You don't really expect that. Uh, ordinary reducing balance depreciation starts with depreciation quite high in the first year. So as soon as you drive a new car out of the garage, the value plummets. After five years, the value is stabilized a little bit. So it, it, it's a bit, little bit odd. It, I always regard it as a bit of a fiddle, really, uh, so that it is arranged to give you this constant uh, residual income.